On March ONS 2001, Japan experienced one of its greatest natural disasters. An earthquake of magnitude 9001 was recorded off the coast of Japan. A large part of the country is hit by violent seizures. The earthquake creates an enormous wave, 30 meters high in places. The tsunami reaches the Tohoku region in less than an hour. The prefectures of Iwate, Miyagi and Fukushima are the hardest hit. The tsunami ravaged everything in its path, sweeping away cars, boats and even homes. Many coastal towns and small villages were destroyed, buried by the wave. In some places, the tsunami reaches as far as 10 kilometers inland. One of the world's largest nuclear power plants, Fukushima Daiichi, is also affected. Three of its reactors melt down and explode within days, releasing a radioactive cloud. This cloud spread through the air and over several areas. It was the biggest nuclear disaster of the 21st century. To be on the safe side, the areas around the plant were closed and evacuated with safety perimeters of 20 to 30 kilometers, leaving entire towns abandoned. In all, more than 20,000 people died or disappeared as a result of the disaster, and hundreds of thousands were forced to move. I was here six years ago, and now I'm back in the same areas. Have people returned to live? Has the area been completely rebuilt? That's what I'd like you to find out in this video. This video is made possible thanks to the support of Revolut. Revolut is a free online bank that avoids charges for payments and withdrawals abroad. You can use their card anywhere in the world. Revolut is super convenient when you're traveling because it avoids payment and withdrawal fees abroad. And you have access to an excellent exchange rate, the interbank rate, one of the best available. On the application, you can perform a huge number of tasks. For example, you can change your money yourself directly and it's really fast look I'm going to change them into basic yen simple of course you can also use your card in stores with excellent exchange rates the creation of your account as well as the card is free depending on the one you choose I've decided to go for a metal one that I can personalize and for the record I spent more time customizing it than creating my account I put lots of little logos on it referring to the channel's themes and I chose purple purple is different it's different it's different with these cards, you can pay anywhere, free of charge. Another interesting and original feature is that you can create single-use virtual cards for internet payments. And that's pretty cool. You generate a card that can only be used once. Not bad when you don't know the website and don't really trust it. So there's no risk of piracy, which is really handy for this kind of thing. I've included a link in the description to download Revolut for free. And by using this link, Revolut offers you all 20 euros. It also supports the chain and makes this kind of project possible and one of you will be drawn to win a thousand euros. It's not bad. It's not bad. We've just entered an exceptional place. We're in an old, abandoned Japanese store, which really hasn't changed in 10 years. People left overnight, as we're used to seeing. But this place is quite exceptional. I honestly didn't think I'd find a place like this again in 2023. I thought it had been rebuilt and cleaned up. And here, we're back to an apocalyptic scene. It's typical of the kind of clothing stores you see when you go out of town a family store where you've got every type of clothing from children to grandparents. But it's really a typical thing that you still find today. And I mean, even the clothes, they don't go out of fashion. It's really a store you could be in today. It really is a roadside building. We stopped. We saw a little bit. Ah, it looks like it's open. Let's have a look. And that's what we found. The store concept is really clothing, but you'll also find shoes, leather goods, pantyhose and underwear. There's also a children's toy section and a lot of bedding too. A small section for hats, socks and scarves. More tights, everything the family needs. Here, socks, kids. It's all there. 
All the items are still packed with prices. Everything's here. It's one piece. It's stuff that's still relevant now, is it? Yeah, it's one piece socks. Look, you got Luffy, you got Don Flamingo. You see, we're not in a world that's disconnected from today's world. It's really the anime that's still on now. It's relatively well preserved, you see. You can still see the color of the original shirt. It's been 12 years. It's crazy when you think that when there was the earthquake, etc., there were really people at that time shopping, I think, in this store. And they left, they left everything. There are places where you feel they've tried to salvage things or they've tried to close down to save things more or less. Here, you feel that the staff have gone and left everything like that. Really, the store hasn't moved since the earthquake. That's what's so crazy. We just found a toy department that's still intact. Really, it hasn't moved. There are a few toys on the floor, but it's really impactful. When you see toys, I think, in an abandoned place, it gives you a different take on the whole thing. There are children's shoes and everything, and it's really intact. You can see there's not a single thing that's been taken off the shelf. There are two or three that have fallen off, but that's because after a while, the plastic and cardboard give way. But really, it didn't move. That's the way it was back then. And this is my favorite department too. Everything toys. Here, look, you've got a Tamagotchi. It's the little things that really make an impression. You see, tack. It's amazing. Obviously, we're living from paintings. For me, it's magnificent because the place is very visual, very cinematographic. But of course, it's terrifying because of the catastrophe and what happened here. Uh, no, I was thinking that uh, when you think of the, the earthquake in Fukushima, you think a lot about the loss of life, the lives that have been shattered and everything around that, but there are also businesses. So obviously that's secondary, but there are also shopkeepers who have lost everything. There are people who have lost their jobs. And when I see all the stock and everything it represents, it's a big chain, but there are a lot of shopkeepers. They've really lost their jobs, their business. And then there's also a side where in Japanese we say motaina, and you say, it's a shame really, it is a pity. I've been planning to come back here for a while. In fact, I wanted to come back for the 10th anniversary of the Fukushima disaster. But with COVID, everything was postponed. So here we are, 12 years on, with devs to see what has become of this disaster zone. And we start by returning to the places that had impressed us six years ago during our first exploration. We found a supermarket, a really big supermarket, and we're going home. We found a supermarket, but a really big supermarket, and we're going inside. Well, no, actually, it's reserved for zone employees. If you don't have an orange broom, apparently you can't get in. Six years ago, we came here to explore an abandoned supermarket. It was super impressive, not only visually, but also the smell inside. It was wow. A disgusting smell. And today, the building has been transformed for the area's workers, for people who come to work. It hasn't changed too much physically. The buildings are still the same, but the functions are completely different. I don't know how they cleaned it up, it must have been a mess. Yeah, they just kept the old ones. They, they didn't bother, in fact, I'd like to say. Uh, they renovated the inside, but the outside doesn't really matter, so they left it like that. And now we can't get inside, no, it's all locked up. And, uh, uh, and even then, it's really for staff only, unfortunately. Unfortunately, so many memories. True. No, but apart from that, something quite incredible has just happened. We're in the area where, back in the day, here behind us, there were vintage cars on display. An orange and a hearse. And quite a few urbex photographers were taking pictures. Well, it's been raised, it's been removed. And I make a joke to Tevs by saying, imagine, there's the motorcycle from the era there. And I think, I think it's there. They moved it. You know, they put us on the side. It was on that street. It was, a, they really moved it from the, by 20 meters. Yeah, it's really that one with the round headlight there and everything. Well, look, she's, she still survives, right? I'm really impressed. I mean, we're looking at it right now. See if the buildings they've moved or they've changed, demolished, rebuilt. A building is a building. Here, we're talking about a piece that could be taken to the dump. I mean, they demolish whole buildings. They can take things like that, but then maybe they don't know who it's going to. I mean, it's crazy because 
really there's nothing left of what we saw six years ago except this bike in fact that's really what was left because all that stuff didn't exist the solar panels the houses they didn't exist back then it's crazy isn't it we're in the orange zone which means we're in neighborhoods that are completely empty with abandoned houses and so on because nobody's allowed to live there and there are lots of shops like that for example this is a laundromat there it is the launderette i recognize it it's exceptional we're heading for the shelter you're right it is and in fact it's here she's still here i don't know if there's anything inside i don't believe it ah bye is there any laundry left in the washing machine drums against ah on the other hand you're going to get ripped red zone with this kind of place you can really see that it was panic and that they had to leave the areas very quickly they left their laundry like that that's come some back, brother. Come, come back brother because it's, because it's amazing they're gone very, but it's very, a real very empty it's like that it's clear it's clear it's clear i'm so happy to discover this with you that was kind of the idea of this video too a before and after what happens and now we're back in a place we'd visited before and it was incredible and today yeah, it's changed a little but the truth is the place still exists and i think that in a year or two there won't be anything left maybe some houses a hotel they've taken everything down but they've still left the posters it's really the same posters we saw several years ago it hasn't changed and the certificate of that they're fit to open a launderette is still there you don't know where the others are I'm currently in a brand new housing estate. Some houses are inhabited and others are completely empty. And it's quite incredible to find myself here today since we're in the heart of the exclusion zone. The one we visited together, the famous red zone, where we had to get permission to come and wear masks and overalls, do checkups, measure radioactivity on the vehicle, etc, etc, etc. Everything you see in the first video. We go from a destroyed ghost town to a modern residential area. It's totally changed. In fact, six years ago, when I was in the area, the radiation was around one and sometimes two. So it was pretty busy. And now, if I look at the official GGR counter, it shows 035. But 035 isn't much, it's really not much. The norm is 010020. We're in the path of the radioactive cloud, which is why we were in the red zone. The famous Fukushima cloud really did pass through here. There's quite a striking contrast between some areas that haven't really moved in 13 years and here, something that's been completely redone, but it's brand new. So Fukushima really is a contrast zone here. It's quite strange to see. You see whole neighborhoods springing up, like this station. And at the same time, everything looks so empty. Some people have returned to live in the areas previously evacuated, but a certain number still refuse to do so. On our route, we passed only workers on dozens and dozens of reconstruction or decontamination sites, and everything gives the impression that everything is built for them, just like this place. As the day draws to a close, I'd like to talk to you about a rather interesting theme. That's where we're going to sleep in this prefabricated hotel. So, it's mainly for the workers and people who work in the area, you see, there's no one there, no tourists. It's completely empty. There are only people who work in the area. There aren't many hotels in the area, and not many restaurants either. It's starting to come back, but there aren't many compared with elsewhere in Japan. So, you see, it's a very small room, just the necessities, with the bed. On the coast, we saw these anti-tsunami barriers. There are also imposing concrete dikes that have been built to reinforce the shoreline. And among the new constructions, we saw some quite astonishing protection systems, even for Tevez. In Fukushima, this is the first time I've seen a structure like this. We're standing at the top of a tsunami shelter that reaches about, well, not about exactly seven meters above ground level and just over 11 meters above sea level. I am... So, in the event of a tsunami warning, the neighborhood, I think, is invited to come up here. It can accommodate 100 people. 
there's even a ramp for people with disabilities. So in addition to all the dikes and everything that's set up at sea level, there are facilities like this just about everywhere. Well, just about everywhere. In any case, there's one here in Fukushima province, and it's powered by solar panels. So even at night, it's lit up. Another very impressive thing we came across on our trip were these endless piles of bags. We came across them everywhere along the way. These were contaminated soils removed from the ground and stored in these bags. At the time, there was only one access road, Route 6. Today, other routes have been reopened, but there are still a lot of closed passages and neighborhoods still completely abandoned. Can you tell me about the store we just found? Yauchi. Uh, first of all, I can tell you that uh, we're right next to a town center. Well, downtown is a big word, but they're in the process of redeveloping it with brand new buildings, a train station, etc., as we've just seen right next door. And just around the corner are all the streets that haven't yet been redeveloped. And you can really see what it looks like before the peeling machines go through. And here, for example, we have a small store. In fact, it's half a small store because this building is incredible. Look, you get the impression that you can walk in and it's a normal building and half of it's missing and you end up in the backyard right here. It's crazy. Oh no, just hand me the camera. There was a manga collection. Okay, now we've found a beautiful house, a beautiful old house. Just be careful, thief, with the socks. When you pass there, there are the socks. They're clean. No, they're not. They've been washed. Look. Ah, oh, yes, you're right. Yes. You can tell it's an old house, you know. Probably grandparents who live there, old people. The decor, the style, it's... I feel like I'm in a Ghibli, clearly. I forgot that it's aged a bit badly though because... Yeah, well that's for sure. There's the catastrophic side and everything. You really have a rather special relationship with this Fukushima disaster, linked in particular to your activity as a YouTuber. Can you explain that to me? Because it's true that we've never really talked about it. That, uh, first of all, I have the same relationship with Fukushima as all the Japanese. Uh, as I was there, we all experienced it as a bit of a trauma. Um, it's really an experience you don't forget. It's a bit like the World Trade Center, things like that. You know exactly what you were doing when it happened. After that, as I'm curious by nature, it's true that I went there quite a few times, even before making the videos. As soon as the road north was opened, I went to see the extent of the disaster. So not just Fukushima, but also the areas further north that were ravaged by the tsunami. And yes, I've made several trips like that. And more importantly, I've done it at various intervals, a few weeks, months after the disaster, right up to today, when it's about 12 years later. So in the province itself, I came quite a few times. And in earthquake and Fukushima disaster documentation mode, yes, that must make five or six times, something like that, including twice with you. But what you didn't mention is that your first video posted on YouTube was this famous train video. It's true that my first video posted on YouTube, I opened my YouTube channel the day of the earthquake, and my first video, so it's not about Fukushima, but it's the day of the earthquake, when all the trains in Tokyo were paralyzed because it caused a huge paralysis of all transport. And not only that, because there was no electricity, there was a lot of security in place, so road traffic was cut off, lots of things like that. So my first video that I really put on YouTube was this. It was Fukushima, it was the March 11th earthquake. So yes, in the end, my YouTube career, if I can call it a career, is intimately linked to that day, the 11th of March in the year 1011. The most striking feature of every house we visit is the... the clocks. They're all stopped at different times, but it's really the contemporary object that once again marks the stop in time like that. One of the most striking things about Fukushima in this area is the abandoned cars. There are an awful lot of them, of all kinds, which have been lying around for years and years. You see, there are two more. They're really sleeping, these ones. It's not uncommon for people to ask why there are so many uh, abandoned cars, uh, as was the case in Fukushima. Here, I think we were on a family with two cars. They left with one car, they left the other. And after that, the areas are either condemned or people aren't allowed back in. So they're obliged to leave their cars behind. And when it reopens several years later, the cars are no longer roadworthy. The tires are flat, so they finally abandon them. And even if you move to the other end of the country or to Tokyo, it's not easy to come back here and take your car. So that explains why there are a lot of abandoned cars, but when we say a lot, there really are a lot of them, and of all standards.
This is our Geiger counter, our Geiger 3 counter. Three of us get excited when we arrive in a residential area. First of all, it's neither Geiger nor Geiger, but Geiger Müller. This counter allows us to detect the presence of radioactivity around us. As a reminder, radioactivity is impalpable, odorless, colorless, and tasteless, but it can be detected and measured with specific measuring devices and instruments. The Geiger counter is one of them. The subject is fairly technical, so I won't go into too much detail, but I will show you this chart, which will help us understand the risks of exposure to radioactivity. It's important to point out that we're all exposed. In nature, there is some. When we fly, for example, we're exposed. When we go for an X-ray at our doctors, we take a micro dose of radioactivity. In Switzerland, for example, the annual dosage is around. These are acceptable, risk-free doses. With the Fukushima disaster and the famous cloud, radioactive particles have been deposited all over the area, so that some places are well above average and dangerous to health. And that's something we were able to observe throughout our trip. With a personal Geiger counter, like this one, if I go back to the table, it's clear that we're even exceeding what's noted on the indications. So we'd better not stay here too long. Japan's official counters, which can be found all over the area, also showed very high levels of radioactivity at times. That's why most people can't return to these towns. Rest assured, it's not like that everywhere. Most of the time, it's around, so the average. It's only in certain places. What's also very interesting to note is that all the above average measurements, above one, were taken in accessible locations. Around us, there were workers, people at work. We were just passing by for a few minutes, so the risks are limited. At least in our case, even if we did sometimes get aberrant figures. As can be seen here on our meter, it can't even display the dose correctly. It stops at places like these. It's not just radioactivity that's dangerous. We visited all sorts of abandoned buildings, and sometimes you could feel that the air in the place was really bad. Here, it's an old hotel that was submerged by the tsunami wave. So, in addition to the dust and ambient particles that were very present, a lot of things had rotted away inside. Carpets, furniture, revealing fungi. Typically, these masks gave us the protection we needed to continue exploring. Can you hear us when we speak? But yes, they're used to seeing us like this. Damn, by that, you know, I... No, but there's shit. Look, this is shit. Enough. Uh, Here are the little displays we put up less. Sushi, sashimi. I bought You really see such a difference in air quality. It's really pure now. We were really in a non-dry environment. It's true, by the way, when you take it off, it's... Yeah, no, okay. Wow, I've just walked into a house that was open, and I've definitely, for the moment anyway, come across... The most unlikely, the most unusual object I've found in all my exploring. I think Benoit is coming. Shall I show it to you, or will you discover it at the same time as Benoit? Hang on a sec. Yeah, I'm here. I thought you were... I just found the strangest thing. I've ever found. You'll see. I am. Come on, let's go. It's okay. Ah, uh, yes, then there's no doubt about it. You can really tell it's stuffed because there's literally straw coming out of the turtle. What's that? And what is this thing? That it's really scary. It's really strange. It's forbidden now in Japan. Well, it's really poaching mode. Even in France, I have a friend from Martinique. He also has a turtle shell in his living room. Yeah, a shell's okay, I but now we're... Yeah, well, it's the DVD. I think it's a bit of the same lease. You really shouldn't think of it as a 2003 Japanese tradition. But there was a time when it existed. And I think I once saw a turtle like that in a restaurant in Okinawa a long time ago. But it's creepy. It's really well placed. It guards the house. And did you see there are animal tracks there though? 
I don't think it's the total. So what were we looking at back then in this house? Already the format is VHS, so there is VHS indeed. So what are we watching? What are we watching? A film I don't know, Strangers. Do you know it? I think Strangers is really your least. No, I don't know what it is, but it's... Uh, it's strange, I'd like to say, but it works well. But they did have, at the time, DVDs. And this one, we know this, this one. This is where we know the Soldarian. Is the DVD in it? No, there's a 50-50 chance that it's in the, in the player over there. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are in a place you'd probably recognize if you saw my first Fukushima video. We're in a pachinko. A pachinko is really a typically Japanese game. How do you explain that? We're in a Japanese money game. A pachinko. No, it's not a gambling game. It's a gambling hall. It's a gambling hall. And it's not at all the same one we saw at the time, because the one we visited was demolished, destroyed. But we found another one. It's played with marbles, and in fact, it's a slightly cheated gambling room. You play with marbles. You win prizes that you can exchange for money, because gambling is forbidden in Japan. Here, it's a bit of a tricks to get around Japanese law. It's legal pachinkos. It's very well known. In fact, there's something quite incredible about this place, and that's that when I did it at the time, I thought it was so cool, a place, a little bit of money. It's so cool, I was discovering what it was all about. And then, for six years, I never went back. I even came back to Japan, and I've never seen a place like that abandoned. In fact, it's quite rare. It's exceptional to have access to an abandoned place like this. It's very unusual. For example, there are a lot of hotels. There are a lot of hospitals and things like that. This kind of place isn't so easy, because generally, this kind of place is either quickly condemned or dismantled, and this kind of machine is left behind, which are worth a lot of money, and it's often closed down very quickly. We don't have access to abandoned places like that. We also didn't stress the fact that we're really walking on near-death traps. The whole floor is littered with pachinko balls, and really everywhere you walk, your feet go when you put your feet down. Don't pay any attention to mommy. I missed the plane. They're really traps, Kinnikuman musclemen. I don't have the dream, you know? I don't have the dream. Superheroes who fly while farting. Are you serious? But that's not your problem. You go in there, you're really locked into your world. You don't have a clock, for example, and everything's designed to keep you there all day. Here you've got little drinking machines and people come here, they line up in the morning to get their favorite machine and they stay all day. And for some people it's really their daily job. They really spend 12 hours in there, they win and lose. There are people who make a living from it, who line up in the morning in front of it. It's incredible and there's something that's fascinating too. We were talking about Kinikuman, but they have lots of licenses like that. It's really anime. They've linked gambling to anime. I find that fascinating. And behind you, there's a Godzilla. It's really licenses that we love. It really makes you want to play. It really makes you want to play. It really makes you want to see. It's very reminiscent of pinball. We have the licenses with pinball, the Adam family. They have that in Japan with pachinko. And it's even the same principle as pinball. In the sense that you throw your ball, you just regulate the power of your ball except that afterwards you don't do anything else. But it's safe, like a set set, like a slot machine that unwinds. Except that here, in fact, the balls go non-stop. And this joystick here is used to adjust the power of the spring. And in fact, once you've found the power of the spring, which goes to get to the stuff that's worth the most points, you don't move anymore. In fact, you spend 12 hours not moving or else a microphone. It's horrible. There's no notion of fun, really. It's horrible. I don't know if you realize the size. For me, I'm not very, very tall. It's really, I don't know if you realize it, but you're really in the thing. There, you're glued to your neighbor. There's not even, between the seats, there's not even 20 centimeters. There's nothing. You don't have to be fat. And then, you're stuck in the screen. You see, because the seats are fixed, you can't move. It's horrible. It is horrible. You still have the flyers. There's a special Look, thing in March. It's really March, Earth Turn Day. It's normal. I've got some weird ones. Well, that's great. Again, behind the pachinko, just stuck. There's a door that leads to an apartment. And possibly where the owner of this place used to live. And what's interesting is that if you start analyzing objects, you can potentially understand the life of the person and the boss. 
When you see this in the closet, it's really typical Yakuza clothing. Even in the movies, it's a cliche. It's only the imitation crocodile shirt, but it's really in the cliche. The little sky jacket, it's the Yakuza combo, but it's really cool, he's got it. All that's missing are the little black glasses, and then For there. For sure, there are songs that aren't really the handbags of a woman who lives here, but rather gifts given to one night stands. So it reminds me a little of this, because there are lots of little fantasy jewels. In fact, there are lots of things that aren't valuable, but look a little expensive. Opium perfume Yves Saint Laurent. It's typically the kind of thing, it's new to pack, it's typically the kind of thing you're going to give to hostesses, for example, that you've just met. We won't hear it on the microphone, but it's amazing, the atmosphere and ambiance of each place. You see, this is the second clothing store we've done. There's a lot of value around us, a lot of money, and nothing is touched, nothing is damaged. Nobody takes anything. And here's what's interesting. I think it's a men's only store. No, I see heels, the woman. It's a store for men and for women. That's for women? No, but yes, clearly. I wasn't sure either. I looked and then I realized... No, but you're right. It's just that the women's section is just so diluted compared to all the costumes. That every time you come into an abandoned place like this, at first glance, you get the impression that it's been looted because there's so much stuff on the floor. Like here, you've got a lot of displays that have been smashed. And in fact, once again, we're telling you, it's really the earthquake that brought everything down, you see, and we're well aware of the violence. And then you see that it's stuff wrapped in plastic, so as soon as it vibrates a little, it slips and falls. And the earthquake was just like, you know, we said it was two earthquakes in total, it was one or two minutes. So you've got time to drop quite a lot of stuff. That's about 30,000 yen. 30,000 yen. Makes 200 euros. 200 euros. So you've got something for 200 euros. And I don't know how well we'll be able to see the camera, but frankly... It's clean. It's crazy, because I'm sure we're not going to do it. But we take a suit in our size. We put it through the machine. We take it to the dry cleaners. And it's perfect, I think, really. There are some that are very well preserved. It's really a scene of corpses everywhere. That's what I wanted to show you. It's crazy. It looks like there's been a shooting everywhere. There are dead bodies. Here we have ties that haven't moved in 13 years. Since March 11th, 2011. They're all lined up and nobody's touched them. I find it incredible. We're really in a luxury store here or a... No, it's not a luxury store at all. On the contrary, it's a bit like the fast food of suits, if you like. And there are several stores like this. I'm not going to name this one in particular, but there's an old one that's really well known called Aoki. It's a bit like that. And you've got them everywhere and you've got them all over the place. And typically you see the scenes all the time, you know, the Japanese businessmen in the subway. Most people come here to get dressed and it's not very expensive. In this kind of store, what's really practical is that you come to buy your suit, but you've got everything. In fact, you've got shirts, you've got the shoes, you've got the ties. In fact, you come in your tracksuit, you come out, you come out in your suit, but really ready to go to work. You've even got the bags and everything. It's crazy. Once again, budgets aren't, once again, budgets aren't huge. Look at the shoes that haven't moved. But you see, there really are things like that, or even bags, leather bags, things like that you see over there. That's something anyone can use, that anyone could take. We didn't break in, the door was open, anyone could come and take it. And in 13 years, no one has. And that's what's incredible about it too. That's incredible and fascinating and you can't compare it with Europe. And watch out. There's a corpse again. There's a gentleman on the floor. Just explain to me what's going on with them. They warn us that we're not allowed to enter the premises even if they're open and that if the police come by we could be in trouble, but they're really into it. We warn you that what you're doing could get you into trouble, but they don't get angry. They explain politely. They told us we could be there if we had authorization, but that we'd have to ask the authorities in the surrounding towns. I think they're used to seeing people who are hanging around a bit and who are curious. Here, we've just arrived at something quite aesthetic. I really like this kind of place. It's perhaps one of my favorite atmospheres. 
Vehicles dying in the vegetation. In the vegetation. These vehicles come from contaminated areas. And in fact, as time goes by, they put them here. They store them here. They're all old vehicles. You see, if, in my opinion, you put the JGR meter on it, it's going to sound fine. We'll do it later. We just got here. And it's always pretty apocalyptic scenes. In fact, you've already seen this place six years ago. It's one of the first shots I took when I arrived in Fukushima. Cars stopped in time. And today, we're right in the middle of it and it's incredible. It's very Last of Us-like, with the cars on the wire. And all the people trying to leave the city had to run away from the cars. It's mega impressive. It's really the definition of nature reclaiming its rights. Not only can you see the vegetation eating up the vehicles, but there are also many, many signs of wildlife. Scenes like these really take the piss out of us. And it reminds us once again that overnight, people and whole families have lost everything. Not just their homes, but also, for example, their cars and lots of personal belongings. And it's by filming, coming and living in these kinds of scenes that we realize just how much the disaster has affected hundreds of thousands of people.